Hello everyone and welcome to this channel where we cover everything from history to current affairs. Today's episode is about Nepal's electricity crisis, which makes it current affairs. Get it? For over a decade, Nepal had an electricity crisis. A big one. And Nepal shouldn't have an electricity crisis. You see, Nepal has 2.2% of the world's water resources. And that's a big deal because it only has 0.03% of the world's area. Its 6,000 rivers provide a potential head, not that kind of head, you filthy mind. They have a potential height of 4 kilometers, providing high energy density. All in all, the country has a theoretical potential of generating 83,000 megawatts and a more practical economic potential of just over 42,000 megawatts. How much of that has actually been realized? Well, in 2020, that figure stands at just over 1,000 megawatts, meaning much of this potential is untapped. Get it? Untapped. A bit of history first. The first power station was set up in Patbing, completed in 1911, making it only the second hydroelectric plant in Asia at the time. Let's fast forward through the wonderful, wonderful time that was the 20th century. And at the turn of the millennium, many parts of Nepal remained yet to be electrified. But reach was expanding. Urban centers and industrial corridors had enough power. And there weren't many plant power outages, which is what we call load shedding. Those started after 2006. And after 2008, shit hit the fan, which wasn't moving, of course, because there was no power. The demand for electricity started exceeding the supply in 2006. Households were handed out rosters with times when power cuts would occur. Oh, come on, said the people of Nepal. Sorry, there just isn't enough water in our rivers, said the National Electricity Authority, or NEA. And then in 2008, the southeastern plains of Nepal were inundated by the Kosi River. There was still load shedding for two hours a day, two days a week. In August that year, load shedding went up to 16 hours a week. Yo! said the people of Nepal. In the dry season that followed and for years after, load shedding went up to 16 hours a day, at times hitting 18. Imagine that! You had 6 hours in the day to charge your phones, laptop, run your washing machine, rice cooker, heater and your fridge only worked for 6 hours a day, meaning it was useless. Of course, a vast majority of Nepali people did not have all these appliances. They just had to live with no light in the night, no fans during the hot summer months in the plains, and no heating in the cold areas. The industries suffered, the service sector suffered, and the people of Nepal suffered. Some estimates place the loss of Nepal's GDP at 7%, meaning that in over a decade of load shedding, the country lost a sum equivalent to its own GDP. Not having reliable electricity meant the country could not transition to clean fuel for cooking, relying instead on firewood and non-renewable energy, which is bad for health and environment. The service sector and information technology became stagnant. Factories couldn't operate around the clock, but more on that later. Access to internet was limited. And while the rest of the world was making huge strides in every field, Nepal was stuck in the dark ages. Literally. The per capita consumption of electricity was among the lowest in the world. 432 times less than that of Iceland. And 6 times lower than that of neighboring India. Seriously though Iceland, what are you doing with all that power? The only growth there was, was in the sale of inverters, batteries, solar panels and diesel generators. All of which was bad news because every one of those items had to be imported, along with LPG used in cooking, widening the trade deficit with its biggest trade partner India and the rest of the world. The only resource Nepal had was water, water and water and that remained untapped. Add to this the fact that plant projects were delayed, production during dry months dropped to less than 50%, the government at the center was unstable to say the least, and there were no attempts to diversify sources of energy. Nepal was in a deep, dark tunnel and there was no light at the end of it. Get it? Light. By the end of 2016, people had learned to live without light. Everyone knew their rosters by heart. The roster would change and they would learn the new one by heart. To its credit, the NEA was highly efficient and punctual at carrying out these power cuts. On the night of Lakshmi Puja that year, or the Pauli, the festival of lights, people read it themselves to celebrate it as they had done for the last 10 years. With little oil lamps and candles hoping to cut through the darkness of the streets and the night sky. Even with only a fraction of households rostered to have power, demand would reach its peak, while most parts of the capital and the rest of the country would be shrouded in darkness. But that night, the lights did not go out. The nation collectively gasped. Kocha, said the NEA. 
Why did the lights not go out? You see, the NEA had recently undergone structural changes and diversified its sources, upping the production capacity by over 100 megawatts. And the key figure in all this was the new managing director of the NEA, Kulman Gising. Now Kulman, as his name suggests, was a rather cool man. Having studied power management, he had worked in various capacities in different power projects before being appointed the MD of the notorious NEA and given a free hand by the then energy minister Janardhan Sharma and the prime minister and charged expressly with ending the power crisis. I work hard for the money. That night, he stayed at the office, monitoring the input and output of electricity, checking to see if the system would crash at peak demand. But the system held up, the nation rejoiced, and Kulman went home to sleep. Well, maybe. Or maybe he hid the town. In either case, well deserved. The next day, he emerged and declared the days of load shedding were over. But there was more to Nepal's electricity crisis than just supply and demand. During the load shedding years, the common refrain given by the NEA was that there was more demand than supply. The figure of 1385 megawatts was repeatedly pointed at, saying the country just did not have that much power. But that was only the peak hour demand. In the winter of 2017, 2013-2014 in your calendar, yeah, we have our own calendar, live with it. The demand was 16 million units and the supply, 12 million, covering three-fourths of the total demand. And yet, households faced 12 hours of load shedding every day. Where was the balance going? Part of the answer is spillage. The NEA lost over 25% of its electricity to spillage. This included households and even companies that stole electricity by hooking poles to transmission lines. They had no meters and did not pay for the power they used. And then there was the murky, dark side story. During the load shedding years, NEA had a practice of providing dedicated lines to industries in the major industrial corridors of the country. These lines gave select factories uninterrupted power supply at one and a half times the rate per unit. Given how much cheaper electricity is compared to diesel needed for backup power, these companies were able to save hundreds of millions of rupees in running costs. Fair enough, you might say. Gotta keep the industries alive. But the process of allocating these feeder lines was haphazard and random. Large industries with influential businessmen at the hem were given direct lines where smaller companies could not get these favors. And households faced disproportionate power cuts. Many irregularities have since been uncovered with regard to these feeder lines, implicating powerful people in the NEA as well as the erstwhile governments. The Center for Investigation into Abuse of Authority, or CIAA, not to be confused with CIA, the criminal organization, has launched an investigation into the distribution of these lines. Since 2017, this practice of handing out direct lines has ended. Households were given uninterrupted power and industries required to run off-peak hours to mitigate the load. More micro-projects have been added to the grid. People that were hooking, and we will not call them hookers, were given amnesty and a chance to get meters, cutting down on spillage. And the government and NEA have pushed heavily for a transition to LED lamps. LED lamps are highly power efficient. A 14 to 20 watt lamp gives out as much light as a 100 watt incandescent lamp. Wait, what? said the people of Nepal. Yes, said the NEA. Yes, what? said the people of Nepal. Yes, what? said the NEA. Why you keep us in the dark like that for a decade? asked the people of Nepal. Who? said the NEA. Who? said the government. And who? said all the previous governments. In short, Nepal's decade-long problem of load shedding came to an end, almost magically, almost overnight. Load shedding still existed in places outside the capital for a while, but that too came to an end in 2018. Everyone was happy. Except, well, maybe the inverter and solar panel companies whose import and sales dropped to zero, and companies that had earlier spent heaps of money on dedicated lines and greasing pumps. Kulman gained a cult status, and some of his peers and predecessors were left seething. In September 2020, as his tenure drew to an end, people marched on the streets at the height of the COVID pandemic, asking for him to be reinstated. The government directed the police to disperse these crowds and instead spent its time and effort on nominating a candidate who had lost the elections to the upper house. Not cool, said the people of Nepal. What you gonna do, said the government. And nobody did anything anyway. But let us leave aside the power play. Get it? Power play. As of 2020, 95% of the households in Nepal have been electrified, with 72% having access to reliable, affordable and uninterrupted power supply. 
Dozens of major and micro hydropower projects have been added to the grid, with more in the pipeline, and supply will exceed demand in the next fiscal year. Supply will exceed demand, and that is a massive problem. In September 2020, the Independent Power Producers Association of Nepal, which is uninterestingly called IPPAN, when they could have totally called themselves the Power Rangers, declared that they were anxious about the future of Nepal's electricity and called on the government to facilitate export as well as plan policies to increase consumption. In the next three years alone, the total generation will exceed 6,000 megawatts, but the domestic consumption is not expected to cross 17 to 1,800 megawatts, as was seen in the recent lockdown. Looking to increase domestic consumption is not practical. Heavy industrialization is unlikely. And the government itself creates roadblocks for the use of electric vehicles, refusing to lower taxes on their import. Given how expensive motor vehicles are in Nepal and the condition of the roads, massive sale of electric vehicles in the near future is also highly unlikely. As such, Nepal will not be able to consume all the electricity that it produces. The plan all these years had been to sell surplus electricity to India and to Bangladesh. But that is easier said than done. India, for one, has enough electricity. And if it needs more, it can get way cheaper electricity from coal and solar. And even has the nuclear option. There is a power sharing agreement where Nepal imports some and exports some electricity and 11 cross-border transmission lines have been planned. But the question is, will India need to import electricity from Nepal at all? The situation with Bangladesh is tricky too. Bangladesh gets most of its electricity from natural gas and its supply is depleting. The country is power hungry. Hydropower from Nepal would not be cheap, but it would be cleaner and more sustainable in the long run. While the two countries have signed a memorandum of understanding, there is no direct border, and any electricity being transmitted would have to use the Indian transmission grid, which lies solely at the discretion of India. This also means Nepal's energy market would be overtly dependent on India, and as such, vulnerable, meaning the bigger neighbor could pull the plug on it any time. Get it? Pull the plug. What then can Nepal do? For the last 15 years, there wasn't enough electricity, and that was a problem. In the next few years, there will be too much electricity, and that is a problem too. Leave your comments below. Practical ones, don't build castles in the air. Don't forget to subscribe and drop suggestions for our next video. Thanks for watching.